Brian Spears has. Oh, sorry. Start again. I already messed up. Way to do. Way to go. Uh, Brian Spears flew for American Eagle Airlines for almost ten years before being hired by United Airlines nine years ago. At United, he's flown the Boeing 757, 767, 777, and is currently a captain on the Airbus A320. Wow, congrats, Brian. Uh, He has accumulated over 12,000 flight hours. He lives in the Chicago suburbs, is married with three boys, and biggest uh, one of all, he is married to Britney Spears. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's right. I'm married to Britney Spears. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. A different Britney Spears, but yeah. Still Britney Spears nonetheless. Still Britney Spears. Um, Okay. So, Brian, last time I saw you, you were taking me up in a uh, simulator. I was, yeah. And at the end, you were doing some kind of training or whatever, but the real event was when I got to uh, uh, fly for a quick, I think, 10 minutes. You were awesome. And, uh, I proved beyond a shadow of the doubt that you can get a 747, I think that's what it was, yeah. under um the Golden Gate Bridge. You 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 can do that. And it was a uh it was the airplane that I'm on right now. It was the A320. Uh so that was uh end of was it the end of 2019, just before COVID started. And uh, I was in training when I when I met you out in Denver and uh got you up in the simulator for that day and I think you had a solid 30 minutes in there. I think you're, you're yeah, maybe you're cutting us short here with 10 minutes. I'm I'm underselling it. Um yeah. what uh that so that was an Airbus. That's even bigger than a 747. No, no, no. So the the A320 is uh is a basically the competitor to the 737. So it's your it's your domestic single aisle uh three mm. and three seating uh anywhere from about 120 to 150 passengers. And they they keep making stretch versions of all these airplanes. So there's the the A321, which we're actually going to be getting at United uh, later this year, uh, that that's going to fit even more people. So it is not as big as a 747 or the 777 or all those other airplanes that I flew at United, uh, but it is uh, it's still fun to fly though. I want to get into a little bit about why you're why you would use a simulator um, as an experienced pilot. But why uh, first thing I want to say is why were we uh, how come we were always taken off of from San Francisco? So at United, we San Francisco is pretty cool. It's it's a great airport for training. So in the in the simulator, um, we there, there's a lot of different things about San Francisco that we're able to use. The the biggest thing is the terrain. Uh, the four runways that they have at the airport are close together, so that it, it does provide some challenges. So all the different scenarios that they can put us in. While we're in San Francisco, it makes it even more difficult. So uh, Denver is another one that we do training. Now, Denver is different because uh, the, the all the runways are pretty far apart from each other, and it's pretty flat except for those couple hills out to the west there. Uh, and then, But it, it's high altitude, so it does provide a few more uh, challenges for us. So we, we don't only train in San Francisco, but I would say – a quarter of my training and from what at least from my training experience with united has been in the simulator in san francisco well in san francisco you have hills on one side you've got water you've got a city all, all straight the way around. Oh, yeah. it's, it's almost like a bowl yeah there's a city i remember when i was taken off i was looking at the hills and then you know there's a city out in front yeah. and and then i don't know there was no fog on mine but yeah. i remember it was a little bit you know it was a little uh nerve-wracking but when we were flying and when you were flying the plane um i never once uh, in those hours, I never once saw out the window. Yeah. So, uh, well, yeah, it, it it's it's a training ex- experience or a training aspect that, uh, yeah, if we can see out outside, it, it makes it a whole lot easier for us. So, our all almost all of our training is done in uh, what's called IMC or instrument me- meteorological conditions, where you you can't see outside. You're in you're in either dense fog or flying through clouds or at, at night where you cannot see the horizon. Um, Didn't you uh, have a real flight where you flew like um, a, a large part of the country when you could not see out the window? Uh, that that happens very frequently. Yeah, there's there, there's days where you you go out and you know you you might see a couple breaks in the clouds below you, but. Um, so yeah, the, the, there's been times where I've been I've done entire flights in the clouds, and it 
that's super common. That's not a uh, that's not abnormal at all. In fact, when we're flying over the Atlantic at night, uh, flying to you know from New York or Chicago over to, to somewhere in Europe, it's almost always cloudy over the over the North Atlantic. And a lot of times we're doing it at night as well. And it's yeah, you you, you can't see anything out there. You, if you get a nice uh, moonlight, you that's about all you can see. Are you flying when you fly that trip? Do you fly kind of north near land or do you go straight across the water we can do either so it all it all depends on the uh the, the great circle route you know if you look at a globe um uh what you think is a direct line is not really a direct line it, it, it's actually going to look like a loop be, because of the, the sphere that that our that the earth is so um and it all depends so they are dispatchers who mostly plan everything for us as far as the 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 routes and and all that now we'll, we'll look over that everything i'm sure we'll talk and talk about that in a bit but um the computers do a great job of planning our flight and specifically our route they look at the fuel burn uh in regards to the winds whether we have a headwind or a tailwind the where the uh, jet stream is uh, so it, whatever is going to be the most economical and, and time-saving, we'll fly that route. So it, it's not always direct line. What you told me a long time ago about, because I was asking you about um, the uh, when a plane goes over the water for a long time, I thought you said something like, is there something called like a 90-minute rule? Uh, th there's several different rules. Um, but like you've got to be, like like if something goes wrong with the plane, you've got to be within like 90 minutes of a, of an airport or something? Yeah, so I think what you were talking about was uh, was ETOPS, and there's uh, there are there's several different rules depending on what type of equipment you have on the airplane uh, and where you are. So, yeah, at any given time, we have to look at what rule we're flying under for that specific flight, and th this is all uh, talking about the the flight planning and that route that we were just talking about with. Uh, with the, the fuel burn and how and how much money it would cost and how long that flight is going to take, uh, you'll when we're looking at the map, there's big circles drawn out there of how far we are from each of our alternate airports or our in route alternates. So yeah, there there are definite rules for we have to stay within airports. So uh, almost everywhere in the world, though, there's very few places that that you can't be within. Uh, a lot of times, it's 180 minutes, so three hours uh, is is a is a very common one. It, it goes even further than that on some airplanes now. I mean, three hours seems almost useless to me as a as a passenger. Like, if you have something serious going on, what's three hours going to do for you? Well, what, what, do you, do you, what do you mean? Say that again. Well, I mean, if you, if it's an emergency, three yeah. hours isn't going to help you. Yeah, sure, three hours could. It's, it's better than nine hours. I mean, if, if it's a medical emergency, I mean. Yeah, if somebody's having a serious, serious... Oh, yeah, I don't care about that. I'm, I care about the plane. Uh, you know, if something's... If, if we need to land, that's why I'm not going to Hawaii, okay? Uh, is because as soon as we hit know. that... I know, but dude, we hit that mid, that midway point. I'm like, there is no option from here. Yeah, we're that's going. it. We're going. Yeah, it's called the critical point. So you're, you're going to... Uh, eventually, you're going to hit that point where you're not going to turn around and and uh, go back to land behind you, we're, we're making our way to Honolulu at that point. Uh, the most, first of all, nothing is common when it comes to malfunctions on the airplane. Yeah. But the thing that we plan on is losing an engine. Uh, and all, all the fuel and all the, the altitude, everything is based on, on what can we do if we lost one of our engines. And a lot of times we're going to have to descend all the way down to 10,000 feet because we're also going to assume a lot of times that we're not pressurized. So we have to factor that in. So we always have enough fuel on the airplane to get to that critical point, which is the worst possible point for something bad to happen, uh, to lose an engine and lose pressurization and then have to descend all the way down to 10,000 feet. Where we're going to burn way more gas than we would up at our up at our cruising altitude of 38,000 feet, let's say. Uh, so that that is why we plan for that uh, to to set up the worst possible uh, the worst case scenario and still make it to Honolulu so you can get on the beach. So you lose that engine, you you should still be fine to get to the the, the three hours. We're probably only about I'd say two hours, maybe two and a half hours 
from land uh, when we're at the critical point going to Hawaii. I'd have to I'd have to look into it. It's been a couple of years since I've been there now. Um, but yeah, we can we can easily fly a single engine down at ten thousand feet for for two or three hours to to make it to make it to land for sure. Well, otherwise we wouldn't be doing the flight. Uh, going into a little bit of like things that people get worried about as passengers. Yeah. Um, so, uh, for example, I know sometimes I, if I'm sitting near like the wings and I start seeing them shake, yeah, uh, that can make me a little nervous. So, explain that one. Yeah. So, I mean, the wing wing shaking is is going to happen. It's it's the the planes are are built. For them to do that uh in fact the more modern uh planes as time goes on it, the, the the wings are getting more and more flexible the one that everyone likes to talk about is boeing's uh 787 the the, uh, the dreamliner that thing that wing flexes so much it's incredible i don't know if you ever sat down and watched any videos of that of the wing flex on that thing but it it from the if you look you look where, where the tip of the wing is in flight, when that wing is producing a whole bunch of lift, it it literally bows, and it I think that wingtip goes up somewhere between twenty and thirty feet higher than where it is uh, when it's when it's sitting down normally. So yeah, th those planes, those wings are completely meant to flex. They can flex quite a bit, can't they? I mean, you can, how, how much could you, could you bend those if you wanted? Uh, to? Each plane does a does a test. And there is, I forgot what the name of the test is, but it, 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 it takes it to its breaking point and they will break the wings off. And I forgot what the number is, but I know the, the 777 had a pretty massive flex somewhere in that 30 foot range. And I'm pretty sure the 787 is right, right around that same point. So yeah, so 30 feet from where it started. I mean, can you imagine what, I mean, 30 feet, that, that's three stories up in the air. That, that that wing is is flexing so when you're sitting out at the window and, and looking at the wing and you see that thing move it, it it's doing what it's supposed to do in fact now, when you're flying and that wing is moving around that wing is is taking some of that turbulence away from you yeah so go into turbulence because you know my, my thing is what i do normally is if i start going like oh this this seems like something's bad it's happening i look over at the stewardesses and if the stewardesses are like just acting normal, then I'm like, oh, everything's okay. Yeah, you're 100 percent right. So uh, if you ever see one of our flight attendants, you know, turn white eyed and or bright eyed there, then then you might have uh, a little bit of uh, cause for concern. But <laughs> if they're still sitting there just smiling away, you're you're good. Yeah. What? So t talk a little bit about turbulence. Um, what that means and what that should mean to to, to a passenger who who you know because usually a lot a lot of people you're you're afraid of something that you don't understand. Sure. Yeah. Turbulence is is it comes in all different flavors. Okay. Uh, the number one thing to know though it is extremely normal. Everybody talks about it because it happens on every single air on every flight there is some level. It could be very very mild or uh, you could be one of the unfortunate people who experiences severe turbulence, but uh, turbulence is just a uh, it's just movement of air that you're flying through. So when the wing flies through the air, turbulence is, is just caused by a, a change in the wind or a change in the air that you're flying through. So it could be a change in pressure or a change in, in wind speed or direction. And as the wing is flying over that, you're just experiencing it. Uh, through through the wing, so I've had some some I would call it severe turbulence before. I mean, everybody's had the worst turbulence that they've ever expected or ever experienced, and and mine I do remember it it was it was shocking. I mean, it it I was a I was a pilot. I was a first officer at American Eagle at the time, and um, it hit so hard I did not know that it could do that. Nothing like that has happened before, but uh, there are different levels of turbulence. The most common that you're going to have is is just light turbulence, where it, it's almost comforting. You're, you'll be sitting in the back in your seat and it's just kind of just moving and shaking a little bit. Uh, that usually will just go away. If it creeps up to what we call moderate turbulence, the best way that we use to, to decide if it's moderate or not is if you're holding a cup of coffee, if 
if you pretty much can't keep that coffee in the cup at that point, you're, you're experiencing moderate turbulence. And that's generally the worst you're gonna get, except for those rare occurrences where you're gonna get a little bit more, more severe. If we do have some severe turbulence after we land, now we, we'll be able to continue at that point to our destination with, with severe turbulence, unless there's an injury. Uh, but we may have to get, uh, get the airplane inspected, uh, but I've never had any issue. There, there's, as far as I know, turbulence has not uh, has not been a cause of of any of any incident, at least for anyone that I've ever talked to. Yeah, uh, and you, so you usually know ahead of time because other planes have gone before you. You, yeah, you we, know what the turbulence is, right? Uh, mostly, yeah. I mean, it, it can come out of anywhere, but yeah, there's a lot of cool apps. We use an app now called SkyPath that basically our our iPads are talking you know via wi-fi via the internet to each to each other so everybody at united has access to it a lot of us do use it and if somebody experiences turbulence the the ipad actually records the the movements of the ipad itself and sends that out so i i, I get little color-coded uh uh little symbols in front of me if if something does uh produce some turbulence so we do have quite a bit of tools now at least more now than obviously that we've ever had in the past to help us out. Uh, but the biggest thing is, is our, is weather forecast and, and our, our dispatchers giving us that information. Uh, if we do have turbulence, we'll report it to air traffic control and air traffic control will let all the other pilots who are in the area or about to be in that area, uh, let them know that they are going to have some turbulence. And then we can relay that information to our flight attendants or turn that seatbelt sign on, have all the passengers seated, make a little announcement, uh, let everyone know that uh, now is a good time to, uh, to, to get in the seats and, and get your seatbelt on. Talk a little bit about, I remember you saying to me a long time ago, about um, you were saying that the, um, I don't remember exact, the exact question I had asked you, but you were talking about how the plane wants to stay in the air. You, you were saying like, God, you know, we yeah, almost yeah. have to, we almost have to yeah. force the plane yeah, it, out, of, out of the sky. These planes, how they're designed now, and it's, I'm not an aeronautical engineer by any means. And, and, uh, but going back dozens and dozens of years, they've, they've developed, they've, from what we know, they've, they've just about perfected how, how these planes are built and, and how long the wings are and the shape of the wings and the tail and every every little aspect of the airplane is has been under great consideration and when it comes to the stability of the airplane each airplane is a little, little different but i remember when i first started flying cessna 172s that that's got to be just about one of the most stable airplanes there is and yeah if you were to push forward if you're just flying straight and level flight and you push forward and then when you let go of the control, the plane is gonna eventually wanna come back up. And if, if you're looking at the side view, it'll probably keep oscillating up and down until it levels off back, wow. at, back at just about where you were, close to it. Same thing with, with, with rolling. You know, If you roll, roll the wings over and you were to let go, the plane is built to come back. And that, that is literally just the shape of the wings. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty uh, cool. Um, what could you flip? Um, you see some of these aeronautic guys, you know, they'll flip these, but they're smaller planes. Could you flip like a 747 or a 737? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess technically you could. Um, you could do anything once, right? That's a joke. Dylan. Yeah, I know, I got it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> would uh what would, would you do it if united um no, you know if they said not. oh if they said we're you know we're promoting our airline there's not going to be any passengers on the plane we're going to let one pilot come in and do a flip you would so you don't think it's safe enough to do it wow so okay so are we talking about like a loop to loop or are we talking about like like a barrel roll a bar uh yeah i guess a barrel roll yeah barrel roll. I've never seen a barrel roll. I, I don't can't imagine you ever you ever going to see one in an airliner. But is it is it capable? Like, can the plane actually do it? Yes. Okay. Simple answer. It, it, it can. Um. Now you talk a lot about the uh, capabilities of of planes. This is one that's always stumped me, though. 
Um, how, so how do you know, first of all, how do you know if the landing gear has come down? Well, that's it. First of all, that, that's very easy. We got, we have lights right on the, uh, on the dash of the airplane that, that, that will show us uh, green. In my airplane, it's uh, green triangles that, that show up for each of the three landing gear. And it's also a lot of things that will let us know, like if we're, if we're closer to the ground where the plane thinks that we should have our landing gear at that point, it's going to tell us it, 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 it'll say landing gear. And, um, but yeah, we, it's, it just, just the instruments will tell us. Okay. But there have been many times, right. Where a plane has to get low enough to where the, um, what do you call them? Control the, uh, the people in the tower, air traffic controllers, air traffic control has to look out at the plane and tell the pilot whether their landing gear is down or not. Yes. I don't know how frequently that, that that's happened. Um, I mean, probably in, in some little small things, you know, in, in small airplanes, but the airline world, and there, there's so many things built on the airplane. If we get to the point where the landing gear is not down, say, say we ran our checklist and for somehow we missed that on the checklist. There's multiple things on the airplane that, that, that will tell, let us know there's, it's redundancy after redundancy. And if all of that fails and we don't know that our landing gear is down, so that means that the, that the, something mechanical is not working um, and something with our indication or our warning system is not working. If we get to that point and air traffic control tells us that our landing gear is not down, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll end up having to go around and, and execute a missed approach at that point and, and figure something out because that's, that is, that's not normal. Okay. I don't think it's ever happened. Or not ever. I, I don't think it's happened at least very recently at all in the airline world. Okay. Cause I was going to say, why don't you just get like a, a camera? Yeah, we, we have them now on, on some airplanes there. We, we do have cameras underneath the airplane. Okay. But, um, but it's, it's. We have we have very simple indications that, that that let us know it's not it's definitely not a guessing game at all. Okay, so could I, if needed, could I land a plane in an emergency? Dylan, you can do anything. Thank uh, you. Yeah, so yeah. so okay, that's not fair. How about the general public? Yeah, I, I, the, I've, I've, I've seen you fly. You you, yeah, you, yeah. you you can do anything. Right. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. I. I think that there's that there's some tools that would that would assist, assuming that you're able to talk to somebody on on the radios and and mm -hmm. have, a, have a professional help you set the airplane up the right way. And if you're at an airport with a nice big wide runway, um, like Denver, like Denver, that'd be that'd be probably one of the best airports to do it at. Um, yeah, I, I I would say you can. I I, I think the most Likely scenario, if that were to happen, would be to set you up for a uh, for an auto land, as most of the big airplanes are are capable of landing by themselves, uh, and it's all basically like programming a computer. So as long as you get it all programmed up correctly, uh, it it can uh, it it can be done. What's special about Denver? Um, why is it so big? It's the largest airport, I believe, in the world. Um, there are large run, very lar long runways. Yeah. Uh, why is Denver so weird? Why is Denver weird? Um, first of all, it's high altitude, right? So you're, you're generally going to want to have longer runways uh, the higher altitude you are. Probably where it's located and the fact that they, when they built that airport, they had so much land to use that they kept everything really, really wide. And they, they, they kept all the, all the runways far apart. I think that how that airport's configured, they're set up for a year, for, for decades in the future before they have to do any real expansion as far as the runways are considered. Um, it's a great location, you know, just, just west of the middle of the, of the country. So, you get we get a lot of planes going back and forth. Uh, um, Denver is a very common alternate airport for all airlines. Uh, so yeah, it, it just makes sense to have big, long, wide runways. Uh, so the, yeah, the easiest 
the, the, the simplest answer to that question is they had the land and they, uh, they put the money into it and, and they did it. Uh, have you seen any of the secretive stuff people talk about in the Denver airport? I, I can't talk about it. No. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. It, I've, I've, I've done the walks. I've gone and seen the, uh, uh, seen the old paintings, which I think a lot of them are taken down now. Do you mean like they're not on like a main floor? You're talking about the, uh, like uh, there's supposedly stuff underground. Oh, oh, I, I thought you were talking about all the, like all the symbols that, that, that they oh, have. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, yeah. There's, there, there's whole websites dedicated to the, uh, to the conspiracies of, of Denver. And no, no, I've never seen any, uh, any hidden tunnels that, uh, that I, I wondered what's through that door or anything. Um, the Illuminati, you know, bunkers yeah. and stuff. Yeah, I, okay. unfortunately, I, I have not, uh, I have not gotten to experience that yet. What if a pilot needs to use the bathroom during a flight? Yeah, uh, we got to go sometimes. So uh, we always have to have two people up in the up in the cockpit at any time. So if I have to go in the back, uh, I have to be replaced by one of the flight attendants or. Sometimes we'll have a jump seating pilot in which that, that would work. Jump seater just means uh, uh, some, usually the seats in the back would be full. So if it's a, a pilot from our airline or just about any, any other airline, they're allowed to sit up in the cockpit with us. So I would, the flight attendant would not have to come up at that point. Um, but yeah, somebody, some, we always have to have two pilots in the cockpit. Or you sorry, were, two, two people in the cockpit, sorry. Uh, how does the, like, how do you, do it like how do you know how to you come out and the stewardess comes up or how does that work <laughs> well i i can't really talk exactly uh exactly how we do it but um it it it, it does get done what if all electronics go out so i remember john travolta was flying his family he was he was piloting you know whatever you pilots 747 uh qantas and he had his family him and his family were flying and uh i think it was at nighttime and all electronics went out and he had to land the plane by looking out the window so all electronics that's I, I believe what you're talking about is a an electrical emergency. So you're down to the absolute minimum. If if all electronics failed and there's no electricity running anywhere, like all the batteries are drained completely, um, yeah, the the plane couldn't fly. But the absolute minimum, if if all the generators have failed and we don't have any normal electricity operating our instruments and operating what needs to be operated um you're, you're going to be down to your batteries at that point and you're we'll, we'll have lost just about everything in the cockpit but we'll still have our standby instruments um and depending on the type of airplane that, that you're flying you will have a couple other basic things that you'll have uh including some navigation to help you find the nearest airport to get down but generally, if you're down on battery power only, you have about 30 minutes till you till that battery's drained. And when the battery's drained, um, yeah, there there's nothing there's nothing to see anymore. So, um, an electrical emergency is about as serious as an emergency can get in an airplane, and that is uh, land immediately. How long can um, you stay in the air with no engines? Let's say both engines went out at 30,000 feet. You're, it's not like you're just going to drop to the ground. No, no I mean, not at all. No, we got the, that's what the wings are for. The wings are, you know, we're, we, we basically just become a big glider. And uh, several minutes, possibly up to, you know, depending on the altitude and the weight of the airplane. And, um, yeah, you're, you're, you're still going to be able to glide for uh, probably a good 10 minutes, maybe even longer. And, um, you know, when we do these simulations where I say we, you, you do these simulations, I guess, every like nine months. Yep. Um, you, so you had to do them, obviously, you as part of getting your new, like with you, I think when we were there together, I think you, you were getting a new plane. 
Right. Yeah. I, that right. was when I first, uh, first became a captain. I was new on the Airbus as well. So uh, our training is set up where we do, you know, more classroom type stuff for a couple of weeks and then you transition into the cockpit. Um, you kind of, there's a um, couple courses, a couple days where you're going to start uh, transferring what you learn in the classroom into the cockpit, uh, integrating all that. And then you go into the full flight simulator, which you, is what you got to experience. So yeah, the, I didn't show up. I didn't show up to class. I no, just, yeah, I just show up to the it. flight. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I figured you'd be there for, you know, two weeks in the classroom with me from, no. from eight to five every single no, day. I'm a, re- I'm a maverick. Yeah. Okay. Well, it clearly you showed that you didn't need it. So it, it all worked out. Uh, so in, in the sim, it, it, we're, we're in the sim for about two weeks. We generally have about uh, 10 to 10 to 12, four hour simulator periods. Uh, if we're doing the full course, le- learning a new airplane. So when we were doing the simulator and and you were, I remember, so I'm sitting in the back, there's an instructor behind you and, you know, you guys would be on takeoff or something. You, there were two of you flying. One of you had the, uh, the foot pedals. Another you, I think maybe another one of you was using the joystick and uh, that the instructor would shout, you know, we'd be on, on takeoff, let's say, and the instructor would shout like, um, I don't know. He, he yelled something that meant, there was no, there was a point of no return on that takeoff. Okay. So, so like we're going down the runway, yeah. and there's a certain point where you're before you've actually lifted off. Yep. Where if something happens, like let's say a, a, a engine, oh, he knocked an engine, so the instructor cut one of your engines out. Yeah. yeah. Right before we were about to lift off, but yeah. he had already yelled, or you had already yelled, whatever, some magic code that he said, won. say it again. V1. V1 that says we are not stopping. Like we still have, we're going. Yeah. You, you, you said it exactly right. Yeah. V1 is our, uh, it's also referred to as our takeoff decision speed in which uh, in our pre-flight planning and uh, when we had the weight of the airplane and we looked at the weather, the, the, uh, the density of the air and the, the wind direction, wind speed, and how long the runway is, we calculate the point in which uh, takeoff, uh, in which rejecting the airplane would be uh, would be a worst case scenario, or uh, it would be worse for us than it is to actually take off. So when we hit V one, takeoff is go at that point. And, and so you guys took off with the one engine, yep. and and immediately, I mean, you guys came back down. Yeah. 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 We'll take off. We got to go do, uh, got to run some checklists and, uh, come back in and then we land on, on the, on one engine. Now, uh, in the simulator, I, I'm trying to remember the specific day that you were with us. That might've been a day where we, uh, where we just did a bunch of, we call them V1 cuts. V, V1 is, is like I said, the takeoff decision speed, uh, a cut is the engine. So, uh, it, it's basically the worst case scenario on a takeoff. It's the worst time to lose an engine right at the, you know, right at that, at V1. So if it happens before V1, we're going to reject that, that, uh, that takeoff. And if it happens well after V1, we're just about airborne or probably already airborne. We uh, didn't do a bunch of V1s. One thing I do remember, I was impressed that the planes could do this. Um, on landing, there was a truck that was in the middle of the runway as soon as we touched ground yeah. and you guys were able to literally touch ground for like a second and, yeah. fl- and pop right back yeah. up in the air. Yeah, go around. Yeah. That's yeah. Uh, we, we train for stuff like that all the time when we're, you know, it, it's, you're, you're, it's probably not going to happen to you. You know, where you're, where you're, you touch down and a truck pulls out, but uh, you know, you're seeing more and more now of, uh, at least it's in the media more now with whether it's an, an airplane at the other end of the runway pulling out or something's happening where we got to be prepared at any given time to be able to, uh, to abort that landing and get back up in the air. So it, 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 it does happen in the simulator just about every single time that, that I'm, that I'm out in Denver doing that. Have you had personally had any scares? Uh, 
I've been pretty lucky. I'll be honest with you. I, I've, I've had a couple like in my be, the very beginning of my flight training. Um, I was actually a flight instructor uh, in a 172 where I did have an, a, uh, an engine failure and was able to get it windmilling up about 500 feet off the ground and uh, was able to recover from that and get back in the air and go back, go make a normal landing. I've had a couple issues where I took off and I remember one time uh, this was at in the back in the regional world here, my, my old airline, uh, the guy filling the gas up left the gas cap off and we didn't notice so we had we had a passenger call up say hey there's gas pouring out of the wing our flight attendant went and looked at it and the it's a big metal gas cap um with like a metal lanyard that's connected to it and right as we took off this thing i guess was just bouncing and beating up the top of the wing so we did have to come back and land and get that taken care of uh but that's a extremely minor issue so i i sorry i don't have any better stories for you uh, but no, I, that's that's actually I, kind of comforting. I, I've been uh, really, really lucky. So uh, what do you say to people? Like for me personally, I don't really have a problem with the landing. I actually enjoy the landing. Okay. Um, it's the the only part of the flight that makes me nervous is the takeoff. That's, that's it. Um, whereas like I know some people who are, I mean, they're terrified of the landing, the turbulence, everything. Yeah, what do thing. you what do you say about um, the takeoff? I mean, is isn't that actually kind of a weird time to be nervous because you're you're flying away from the ground, so like it's it's kind right. of a safe, right? Um, so, Hill, I gotta ask you the question: what What yeah. is it about what is it about a takeoff that makes you nervous? Um, I think the speed. I think it's because, you know, like when you're in the air, you're going fast, but you don't feel it. I think it's the feeling of speed and sound, sort of like a roller coaster, but right. you're not on a track. Um, and you, you're you thinking, well, as it's going up, if something happens, there's very little space. There's very little room for air because the ground is right underneath you. I would say uh, landing is where a lot of things probably happen more it, without doing, without looking up specific research on that. Uh, but takeoff is probably the most dangerous because you, you have full thrust on your engines or near, near full thrust on your engines. And, uh, and it's loud, you know, land, I, I was wondering if what you were going to say was it's the a, a volume thing because that's partly it. Yeah. When you're landing, your your engines are at idle or, or near idle, and it's a lot quieter. And uh, you know, if you have, uh, on a takeoff, you're hearing the rumble. I mean, you're 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 feeling that airplane shake, and it and it's going. So, um, a lot of people do say that they're more nervous on landing. So it, it is it's pretty interesting that that you said takeoff, and and uh, it, it's got to be the noise though for you. It's got to be okay, but you didn't say anything to ease my concerns at all. So what? <laughs> say something. So when you're going up, is the idea that like, look, if there's a problem, we're at least going in the right direction. Like we're not we're not going towards the ground. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I don't. Know. Or not not yet at, at least. Right. Um. Yeah. I mean. First of all, you do know that like n nothing's going to happen on your takeoff or landing. So I mean, it, it's you're going to be fine either way. Well, I've never been asked that question. Are you serious? Yeah. Do, do you mean do you mean specifically about takeoff? Yeah, like um, yeah, I've never like to me most no one has issue with takeoff. It's always landing that that everyone has an issue with. That's funny. Uh, so we've seen a lot of uh, news about pilots seeing UFOs, um, weird things out there in the in, in the sky. Have you ever encountered any of that, or have you talked to any other pilots who have seen some weird stuff? Just like my uh, my history of emergencies, uh, I have not seen anything uh, as far as UFOs go. The coolest thing I would say that I've ever seen, uh, and it it blew my mind. And this was over the Atlantic in the middle of the night. Don't get your hopes up. It was not a. Uh, it was not a UFO. Uh, at least I don't think. Um, pitch dark out. There's no moon. Clouds below us. We. It, it is just black. 
nothing out there. And all of a sudden for about five seconds, it turns, it turns to daytime. Like it, I can see everything. I see blue sky. I see uh, the clouds below me, some ocean off to the side. I look over at my, at my, the guy I was sitting next to and I, I couldn't believe, and it was a good, it was probably realistically only about two seconds, but it felt so much longer because I did not know what happened. It's just daylight. And then I could see straight out in front of me, this bright, bright flash. And after trying to figure out what it was, and it, it was just space junk. It was just something re-entering the atmosphere that lit up so bright that everything around me turned to daytime for just a couple seconds. That, that's about the coolest thing I've ever seen. Um, and I've seen the Northern Lights uh, do, during those flights. See, there's a lot of cool stuff when you, when you fly up in the North Atlantic. But no UFOs, Dylan. So sorry, man. And uh, I was able to avoid all, all uh, Chinese weather balloons. Haven't never never got to see any of those over the past couple months. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, thanks, Brian. Is there uh, anything you want to tell people about? You want to share with them? You you have a web. I mean, usually our guests have like a website or a book they're trying to promote or anything like that. Not this guy. Although I I, I would say uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of demand right now for airline pilots, and at United uh, they've developed this incredible uh, program called United Aviate, and the website would be unitedaviate.com. And if uh, you have have any kids or uh, you're interested in becoming a pilot yourself. You go to unitedaviate.com and it's an incredible place to start. Cool. Well, because, uh, you know, becoming a pilot's ridiculously expensive. Um, I've heard there are some programs. Will, will they actually pay for you to become a pilot? Yeah, I don't know about uh, paying themselves, but there's I know there's a lot of great financing opportunities. I believe they've partnered with uh, J.P. Morgan Chase to, to do some stuff. But uh, even though it is extremely expensive to become a pilot um more than it ever has been uh they're they are reducing uh some requirements uh just because of how competitive uh it, it was at one point and now there's such a demand for pilots that that you know everything from school like uh everyone was at one point required to have a bachelor's degree and uh some of those requirements have have decreased so there, there is cost savings now compared to back in the day uh but again if you if there are any questions that you have or if you are considering become a pilot go on unitedaviate.com and you can get all your uh questions answered right there cool thanks so much brian yeah you got it thanks for having me